in an effort to differentiate myself from literally everybody else making literally this exact same type of video at this time of year, I am going to be ranking every single comic book related thing I've seen this year. So that's right, I'm including the movies and the TV shows and Marvel and DC and the not Marvel and the DC. Um, I would include the anime that's based off of a manga to trigger people to say that it, <laughs> that like One Piece is a comic book thing, but I haven't actually watched any anime <laughs> or anime adaptation this year, so I can't trigger people unfortunately, but just know that I would. Also know that, as with the anime, I have not seen every comic book related thing this year. I watched like five minutes of The Killer, and I got bored. It was also late, maybe if I gave it another shot, I would like it more. Maybe I would still think it was boring. Either way, you should get triggered. I haven't kept up with Superman and Lois, I really want to, I like the show, it's just something that passed me by. Same goes for Doom Patrol, I know Doom Patrol ended this year, I wish I could have it on this list to talk about it. I've actually started re-watching Doom Patrol because I, I did kind of fall off on it, but I'm not going to get caught up with Season 4 before the end of the year, so there is that. Obviously, there's a bunch of like animated DC and Marvel stuff that I just, that, I, I don't know, bro. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not watching Spider-Man and his amazing friends for the sake of this video, you know what I mean? I have 20 things on my list this year, so I think that's enough. Let's get started with number 20. The Marvels is, in my opinion, the worst thing that the MCU has ever done. <laughs> I kind of hate this movie. I, I think it is the MCU at its lowest for a lot of reasons. I think when it comes to just artistic integrity and how obvious it is that this is a studio metal, just Frankenstein's monster of a movie, like every single scene looks like a reshoot where the director wasn't present where it feels like some of the cast members like learned their lines of dialogue like five minutes ago and that's the thing i don't i don't even really know who exactly to blame here because it's like i know that amon Vellani can be great in this role she was great in miss marvel i know that brie larson is a great actress she's a fucking oscar winner I know that Tyana Paris can be good and stuff, I saw her in WandaVision. Maybe you can blame the director, but at the same time, it's like, this director has done good work in the past, you know, she did that Candyman reboot, and it's one of those things where, like, even if those movies aren't amazing, they're not train wrecks. This is just a complete and utter train wreck. And then obviously in terms of box office, uh, this is Marvel's biggest disaster yet, and is really causing them to rework the, their entire thing. I mean, I, I mean, it's not just the Marvels, because these things aren't quite as reactionary this quickly. Um, like, the Marvels really is just the conclusion of everything wrong with Marvel. Everything, you know, just the complete failure that, you know, their post-endgame slate of content has been and just the wake the the ultimate wake-up call that they have to stop making as many projects they have to stop overworking kevin feige they have to start thinking about the quality before the quantity um it seems like they're doing that is it too late we'll have to wait and see but at the end of the day the marvels is in fact the worst comic book related piece of media that i have seen in 2023 all right, at number 19, I have The Flesh, The Flash, The Flash, and Flash. Uh, yeah, The Flash is just really bad, man. It is, so, I mean, yeah, similar to the Marvels. Um, is it the worst thing that DC has ever done? It's been a long time since I've seen Suicide Squad. I don't know that it's as bad as Suicide Squad. I will say that. But it's not good. I think the main reason why I put it, I'll put it above something like the Marvels or Suicide Squad is because there are things to be enjoyed in this. The relationship between Barry and his mom is fairly enjoyable. There is some good chemistry with Barry and Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton is good in the movie, <laughs> but aside from that, it's just like a Flashpoint adaptation that doesn't do anything nearly as interesting as the Flashpoint adaptation does, and... The movie's also just disgusting to look at. <laughs> I mean, it, it truly is. The CGI is terrible. Like, the fact that they try and, like, recreate the Kryptonian battle from Man of Steel, and you look that much worse 
than Man of Steel looked in 2013 is truly just a blight on the comic book movie genre. Like, how does that even happen? And then obviously you have that really weird scene where they bring back all of the like dead actors in a really weird, disgusting manner where it's like just morally dubious at best. I mean, you probably shouldn't do that. It's really weird, made me really <laughs> uncomfortable. One of the most desperate things I've ever seen one of these studios try to do. As if, like, as if anybody's gonna go, whoa, on the CGI Christopher Reeves, whoa. Cause that's the thing, it's, it, it didn't even have anything to do with the movie, with the story or the, or the movie. Anyways, Flash bad, Ezra Miller bad. At number 18, we have Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. This movie is also pretty bad. Yeah, I just didn't care about anything in this movie. It felt like a Star Wars prequel, which uh, not exactly the highest of praises, of course. Um, the villain sucked, d didn't care about him in the least, didn't care about his motivations or anything. He's like, oh, how can we kill the dad? Didn't care about any of that. The only saving grace that this movie had was that sometimes Jason Momoa and Patrick Wilson had good chemistry. <laughs> That really is just the saving grace of the movie. And at number 17, we have Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. Um, honestly, very similar to Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. I think the main reason why I put this above Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom is because while, yes, there's a lot of bad CGI in the movie, I cared about Scott Lang's relationship with Cassie. Even though I didn't necessarily care, like, they didn't do a good job of making Kang be, like, a presence in the MCU like Thanos was. I did like Jonathan Major's performance as Kang. Like, I was like, D he's doing his thing here. I even didn't hate MODOK. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't think, don't get me wrong, I don't think MODOK was, like, great. I interpreted MODOK as, like, being this guy who's been mentally just broken down to where he's a barely functioning mind at this point so it's like all of the wacky stuff that modok does and like the fact that he's this horrifying like like cgi face it was like that all made sense to me and that, that fit with the character so it's like even the scene where like cassie tells him that to not be a douchebag anymore or whatever i was like that and him responding being like i don't want to be a douchebag whatever that scene was i don't even remember what the dialogue i was like that fit with both of their characters because she's like a stupid teenager He's a stupid face. That's how they would talk to each other. I don't know. I didn't mind the character of Modoc, but uh, the, the movie's not per particularly good. <laughs> All right. At number 16, we have Secret Invasion. I'll be honest. I didn't mind Secret Invasion. <laughs> don't get me wrong. It doesn't end well. <laughs> but like, I want to say up until like episode five or six, I was like, this is okay. I thought it was an all right spy thriller. You know, I like Samuel L. Jackson. I like that um, all the guilt that Nick Fury feels after not doing anything <laughs> in Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. This is like his thing, right? Being like protecting the world from these threats and him feeling guilty over not being able to do that. I was like, I, 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 I don't mind this at all. Like, I think the show has some good performances. I think that the villainous performance was good. Um, I, I really liked Nick Fury and his wife. I, I actually thought that was pretty well handled. So it's like, I don't know. Like, yes, this is, the, is the finale just ridiculous where Amelia Clark becomes the most powerful being in the MCU? Absolutely, I'm not gonna deny that. Is it like as good as we all wanted it to be? Absolutely not, it is not. <laughs> um, but I, I, I did not mind Secret Invasion. I just, it's my hot take, I guess. <laughs> and at number 15, we have Shazam, Fury of the Gods. I also did not mind Shazam, Fury of the Gods. I don't know that I really picked up on it in the first time I watched it, but hearing the criticism, I do agree with it that it really does feel like <laughs> Zachary Levi is playing a different character from uh, Billy Batson, the, like the kid actor, where... Billy Batson is like very serious because he's going through a lot of problems in his life, you know, with his family leaving him and stuff. And then Zachary Levi is just like all happy and chipper and whatnot. I, I can I can see where people are coming from with that criticism. But beyond that, I think this is a fun movie. I, I think that the villain performances again are really actually really good. Um, Helen Mirren is doing her thing. Um, what is her name? Wendy Wu. 
Oh, well, that's that was that's gonna be so racist. Holy shit! Oh no! Oh god! What have I done? I'm oh, sorry. I'm looking up her name. Um, what? Where? Where is she? Lucy Liu. <laughs> Um, I also thought Rachel Zegler was actually really good in this movie. Like, I know, I know people are, like, triggered because she said she doesn't like the original Snow White movie or something. But, like, she's good in things. You know, she's obviously great in West Side Story. She was really good in the Hunger Games, the Chutes and Ladders movie. Uh, and she's good in, in Shazam, too. Like, she has really good chemistry with the, the crippled kid. And she has screen presence. She has charisma. I, I don't know what you want me to tell you, bro. But yeah, I thought that Shazam 2 was a fun movie, but at the end of the day, I understand why it bombed at the box office, because audiences are really are at the point where if they're going to watch a comic book movie, it has to be amazing, and it has to be doing something special. And Shazam 2 is really what comes into your mind when you think of a generic comic book movie. At number 14, we have What If Season 2. All right, so I definitely enjoyed What If uh, Season 2 more than What If Season 1, but that doesn't mean that it's perfect. Um, while it is more consistent than Season 1, you still have your bland episodes, like Tony Stark and Sakaar episode, which is just, like, kind of goofy. You know, the Happy Hogan episode wasn't all that great. The last episode, actually, I thought was pretty ridiculous. It was literally just taking a bunch of action figures and bashing them into one another. So I will say, I think the finale of What If Season 1 is probably better than Season 2, even though overall Season 2 is better than um, What If Season 1, because there were also a lot of really cool episodes. Like, the Nebula stuff was really cool. I really like seeing the, like, the 1980s Avengers, or what would be the 1980s Avengers, fighting Ego the Living Planet. You know, the Captain Carter episode was awesome. By the way, there's a lot of Captain Carter hate going on on the internet. I genuinely don't understand it. Like, I'll, I'll say what the kids say and say that the hate feels forced, okay? We stand Haley Atwell, and we will not take Haley Atwell slander. Like, people saying, like, Marvel is trying to push Captain Carter so hard. And it's like, bro, she's in a cartoon where she's not even in every episode of the cartoon. And in her first live action appearance, she was sliced in half. Marvel is doing the complete opposite <laughs> of trying to make Captain Carter into a thing. Anyways, yeah, the Captain Carter episode of season two was really awesome, especially considering the Captain Carter episode of season one was one of the worst, <laughs> one of the worst ones. The Kahori episode I thought was great. He, you know, they introduced a brand new character. I don't, from what I understand, she's not even in the comics. Like that it was all in like a Native American language. The Hela in Mandarin episode was awesome as well. That episode is also really interesting because it indicates that Shang-Chi is like one of the more powerful characters in the MCU with how uh, the Mandarin is able to fight as guardians with the Ten Rings. Like, presumably, Shang-Chi is able to hold his own with some of the most powerful characters in the MCU. So that's that's just an interesting thing to note about that. And at number 13, we have Harley Quinn Season 4. So don't get me wrong, I still enjoy this show a lot. I still think it's really funny. This is still my favorite iteration of Harley Quinn. Bear in mind, I don't really remember Batman the Animated Series, so don't yell at me if you're like, Maybe it is, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> so, like, I, I still enjoy most of the elements of the show. This season just wasn't as funny as past seasons. And in terms of the story, it really does feel like the writers didn't know where to take Harley and Ivy's relationship. Especially because they they don't even really interact for a lot of the season. Like, they're just kind of in separate areas, which could be fine, but I, I don't know. I just felt like the story that they told this season also just wasn't as compelling. I'm hoping that the show can get better in season five because we know it comes back out of season five, but I'm also starting to feel like maybe the show should have ended. At number 12, I have Blue Beetle. A lot like Shazam 2 Fury of the Gods, I really enjoyed Blue Beetle, but I can also completely understand why this movie bombed <laughs> because it's good. I, I really like Jaime Reyes. I really enjoy his family, you know, a, a lot kind of like how I really loved the Miss Marvel family. The family, it act unironically, is what saves this movie. But, you know, there's just also a lot of kind of generic superhero stuff. Like, the villains, they are terrible. They are like, how are we still 
making superhero movies where the bad guy is fighting a bad version of himself. <laughs> like, how are we still doing this? And at number 11, I have the Harley Quinn, a very problematic Valentine's Day special. So, yeah, I believe this, yeah, this was before season four started. They put out this Valentine's Day special. And I actually like this more than <laughs> season four. I, I thought that the relationship between Harley and Ivy was handled better than it was handled in season four. And this episode was just beyond ridiculous <laughs> to a degree that I have to give it props. <laughs> and at number 10, I have Merry Little Batman. So, so this is the only like random animated DC movie that I watched this year. Um, it was just a little like Christmas thing that they threw up on Amazon Prime Video. So I was like, eh, whatever, I'll give it a watch. And it's like very cute. It's basically Home Alone, but uh, Damian Wayne is like Kevin McAllister where Batman has to go away on a thing. So things happen and Damian Wayne basically just has to step up. And I appreciate it for the same reason that I appreciate Home Alone because it is this child like brutalizing adults and you have adults actively trying to murder a child. I really enjoy the relationship between uh, Bruce and Damien. And yeah, even the art style, which at first kind of threw me off. I was like, Ugh, what is this? But I, I kind of grew to appreciate it and they do a lot of really interesting things with it as well. So yeah, Merry Little Batman. I know we're past the Christmas season at this point, but this stuff this is definitely a good one to sit down and watch with your kid. Or if you're an adult with no life like me. At number nine, I have Loki season two. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed Loki season two. I was actually somebody that didn't like Loki season one. I thought Loki season one was pretty boring and meandering and just was like, I don't bro, like why are we just having Loki do a speed run of his character arc <laughs> that he went through in the Avengers movies? I was like, I don't, this is just kind of a nothing show to me. But Loki season two, I thought was a pretty big improvement all the way throughout a lot more engaging. The characters I thought were just more interesting. I think Ke Huan Kui, Ke, Ke Hui Kwan, I, why am I a racist? I thought that Ke Hui Kwan was a really great addition to the cast, and I found like all the timey wimey stuff a, a lot more interesting in this season. And by the end of it, when Loki is like becoming the god of time, I was like wrapped up in everything that was going on emotionally, and I was like, yeah, man, this is this is a really solid season of television, and obviously something that the MCU needed <laughs> as a whole. At number eight, I have Invincible Adam Eve. So this was uh, a lot like the Harley Quinn uh, Valentine's Day special. This is a special that they just gave to us before season two. Um, and I thought it was really great. It's basically just an origin story for Adam Eve. Uh, we get to see her as a child and her like weirdly abusive family, verbally abusive. They don't do any physical stuff to her, <laughs> at least as far as I know. I don't know why I had to go there, but I did. So can't take it back. I mean, I could, it's video editing, but I guess I'm not going to. <laughs> and yeah, like I would say that if you're a fan of Invincible and you still haven't checked this out, it's definitely worth your time because it really does flesh out Adam Eve and adds a completely new dimension to her character. At number seven, I have Gen V. So this is a spinoff of The Boys, uh, which is a popular Amazon Prime show. I guess this is technically not a comic book show, but it's in the world of The Boys boys which is a comic book show i'm in a weird place with the boys to where i feel like the main show is kind of running its course a bit I'm like mm, like i feel like it should be wrapping up soon but i've also yet to dislike a season of the boys <laughs> at the end of the day and when i heard that the boys diabolical was getting made i was like oh, i don't know about this it was some weird anthology show but the boys diabolical was great and then I heard about the boy spinoff show and I was like, Gen V. And I was like, uh, I don't know. I feel like they might be running themselves too thin. Uh, but Gen V is awesome. So it's basically about a university of, uh, of soups and it follows a bunch of the students in it. And it is a really phenomenal exploration of, you know, the struggles that young people go through um, at this age. And I think that's really the best thing I can say about this show is that is that it really does love its characters and they all get fleshed out. And by the end of the season, when everything's going down and you're seeing what all the characters are doing, 
you believe it all. Even though I will say the last episode is a little rushed, but overall, I, I, I still think that the way that the show handled its characters is its greatest strength. And obviously, it's it's the boys, it's ridiculous, it's zany, it's bloody, it's gory. So you're going to get your fill of that as well. At number six, we have Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. I love this movie. Every day we have to thank Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse for just completely rejuvenating <laughs> animation. And I don't necessarily blame like artists or anything like that, but I mostly blame studios for thinking that every single movie after Toy Story had to look like Toy Story. But yeah, man, ever since Into the Spider-Verse, we've been getting stuff like um, that Puss in Boots movie. You know, we're getting this TMNT movie and it's just really cool to see. Uh, but yeah, TMNT Mutant Mayhem is awesome. I love the fact that they actually got teenagers to voice the turtles. I have to assume that they also um, had the kids just like in the same room with each other as well because you because they had really great chemistry with e with each other. There are like moments where they were clearly just like riffing with one another. Like there's like this, there's like this one point where one of the turtles tells Leonardo that he has no Riz, and it's like you know <clears throat> that Seth Rogen has no idea what the hell Riz is. <laughs> no, the, there's no way that an adult screenwriter ha has any knowledge of that word. <laughs> okay, and for number five, actually, I don't know if this is based off of a manga or a comic book, because I don't know how the original thing is classified, but I watched Scott Pilgrim Takes Off. So this is a brand new version of Scott Pilgrim, um, so I've never read the comic book slash manga. I don't actually know what it is. Um, and I watched the movie like when I was a kid. And to be honest, I didn't really remember it all that well. So watching this anime was really interesting because I would be watching it and I'd be like, oh yeah, I remember. I kind of remember what that was in the movie. So that was kind of an interesting, it, it, this was an interesting watch for me, but I had a really fun time with this series. It takes liberties with the source material, I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> I'll be open and upfront with that. I know that that bothered some people, but from what I can tell and from what I remembered, it does it in a really interesting way to where it just really takes the opportunity to show these characters in different situations and show different sides of these characters. And either way, you know, whether it's like the source material or not, I just thought it was awesome. I loved all the characters. Um, I thought it was hilarious. But I thought it was quite meaningful um, what what they do with it at the end of the day. Um, so I absolutely loved Scott Pilgrim Takes Off. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to hear what you would think about it. Uh, maybe if you're a Scott Pilgrim movie fan or if you are a comic book slash manga fan. I, again, I do not know which it is actually. <laughs> okay, at number four, I have My Adventures with Superman. I am shocked <laughs> at how much I loved this show. Here's the thing. I've never actually been a big Superman guy. You know, growing up, I think I watched a couple episodes of like the animated series, but and Superman was never really my thing. Definitely much more of a Batman guy. And then like in 2013, it's like, yeah, but I watched Man of Steel. And I was like, I didn't, I didn't mind it, you know, when I was a kid, but it was like, it was also kind of boring. It was like, they're trying to do like the Dark Knight trilogy, but with Superman, I could kind of see through that <laughs> as a child as well. I was like, okay, I see what you're trying to do. And then flash forward to like, you know, when I was like really into the CWDC shows, I remember I was, I was watching Supergirl and Tyler Hoechlin's Superman came in and I was like, oh, I actually really like this version of Superman. Like he's really charismatic, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, and then going into Superman and Lois, I really like Superman and Lois. I haven't caught up with it. The latest season isn't in this video, <laughs> but I do really like that show. I do want to get caught up with it at some point, but like, I really like that version of Superman, but it's also not really Superman because it's like Superman when he's not at the Daily Planet and he's not really a reporter anymore and he's old and he has kids and blah, blah, blah. So... I say all that to say that I feel like I, I've i never really consumed a piece of Superman media that's like really Superman and kind of what Superman is quote unquote supposed to be. And now that I've seen my adventures with Superman, I feel like I get it now. <laughs> I feel like I, I get why people love Superman because I love this show. The Clark and Lois relationship 
in my adventures with superman is the best relationship that i have seen on tv since uh pam and jim from the office i actually cannot handle how cute they are together like this lois lane is by far my favorite (laughs) lois lane sorry amy adams but you are like one of the most boring people to ever (laughs) exist in hollywood i'm sorry that's mean but that's just my that's just how i feel (laughs) after her performances as lois lane in man of steel um jimmy olsen is breathing so that that that's a plus i guess he he exists uh (laughs) um (laughs) it does kind of jump the shark i will admit you know when it gets into like multiverse stuff unnecessarily i'm like why are you doing this this early but at the end of the day that doesn't take away from how much i adore the clark and lois relationship and how much it anchors this show and how much i feel like i get superman now all right at number three i have invincible season two a so they did a really annoying thing with invincible season two where they only released the first four episodes in 2023 and the second half of the season is coming out in 2024. Like I was thinking of like, of waiting, of just not even talking about it for this list out of spite. But then I realized that that damages my list more than it would do anything to Amazon. So we're here talking about the show, which admittedly is great. (laughs) I mean, I will say starts off a little slow. Like the first two episodes are good. Uh, Like, don't get me wrong, but they weren't leaving me with like, you know, the invincible gut punches that I'm used to having. But then, man, episodes three and four are absolutely phenomenal. Just some of the best episodes of TV I've seen all year. Like, the the fake-out when when you start watching uh, the, the Alan the Alien section in episode three, and then everything that they do afterwards with the rest of the cast, and how that episode is kind of like a love episode <laughs> where we explore a bunch of relationships relationship stuff in the invincible universe i thought was really cool and then obviously episode four happens and it's insane it's crazy and it's like oh my gosh this is awesome so even though i'm annoyed by their release schedule even though i don't necessarily like don't get me wrong the first two episodes aren't bad but episodes three and four are by far and way better at the end of the day i can't deny that Invincible Season 2 is absolutely incredible so far, so it has to be this high on my rankings list. Alright, at number 2, TMNT was great, but you gotta pay your respects to the OG. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is absolutely phenomenal. They do it again, the animation in this movie is just on a completely other level of insane. All the different art styles, how beautiful they all look, how much, how well they flow into one to, to one another is just breathtaking. I mean, the way this movie starts with the whole Gwen Stacy stuff, I was like, oh my god, like I want to watch an entire movie just set in the Gwen Stacy universe. I thought they, the way they fleshed out her character was absolutely beautiful. Um, and then you get into the Miles stuff, and in the first movie, we see Miles become Spider-Man, right? <clears throat> and then in this movie, we really explore Miles solidifying why he is Spider-Man, and I-, I feel like thematically, it all really worked. I know some people are annoyed that this is a part two, but I also do feel like, no, Miles does have a complete arc in this, you know? Not to mention, if you really want to, you can kind of think about it in Infinity War th- terms, where it's like, if you want to say that like the heroes don't necessarily have the best arc, or have a complete arc, which, I, like I said, I do think Miles does, I don't think that you can deny that. If you think about Across the Spider-Verse as a Gwen Stacy story, instead of a primarily Miles story, she undeniably has a complete arc, because <laughs> she starts off that movie with a bad in a bad place with her dad and you know betraying her dad or like running away from her dimension to join the spider society and then the movie ends with gwen repairing her relationship with her dad and leaving the spider society to go back and start her own one so if you think about it as a gwen stacy story i feel like it's undeniably a complete movie (laughs) and uh but yeah no the the movie's incredible it's it's at number two because of course it is and at number one, you know what it is, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 absolutely took my breath away. 
But I was kind of ready to walk into this movie and it just not be all that great. You know, because of how uh, lackluster a lot of MCU content had been thus far. You know, James Gunn came in making this movie um, with it being his last MCU project. He's about to bounce over to DC. So you know, I would have been shocked if, you know, you walk into this movie and it doesn't feel like it has this, maybe as much passion put into it. But James Gunn did not put any less amount of passion into this project. It is maybe his best movie. The way that this is the best MCU trilogy, I think it's one of the best trilogies of all time. And the way they perfectly wrap up each character's arc, the way that they flesh out Rocket in a way that I never could have imagined, and the way they really center Rocket as arguably just the main character of the of the trilogy, at, at least the character that most succinctly represents the message of the Guardians of the Galaxy, which is that no matter how hard your life has been, you can always find a family. Like you can always find a group of people that you can come together with and call your own. The rocket stuff like Mortal Kombat style ripped into my chest, grabbed my heart out, squished it, threw it on the ground and just stomped on it. <laughs> I mean, it was it was brutal to watch, but it was it's the it's the most emotional that I've ever been watching an MCU movie for by far. <laughs> I mean, uh, not not even a question. You know, in terms of visuals, when you look at how bad MCU movies have been looking recently, you know, this movie looks beautiful, especially compared to a lot of recent MCU movies which look just disgusting. <laughs> um like all the sets feel handmade and real and lived in and it doesn't it never looks like they're just standing on the volume sound stage. This movie is absolutely phenomenal and I think that going into 2025, you know, when Marvel and DC properly come back, Marvel should be absolutely terrified because James Gunn hasn't just made their best movie since Endgame. They've made their best movie, period, probably. If I really sit down and think about it, I'm pretty sure I would come to that conclusion. It is the best comic book related movie slash TV show that has come out in 2023. But anyways, that is my list for 2023. Let me know what your list is. Maybe you included a bunch of stuff that I didn't watch, you know, like Doom Patrol or Superman and Lois or any of the various DC animated stuff <laughs> that they make. <laughs> um, there's probably a random Justice League movie that came out this year. But anyways, I want to hear from you. And I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.